right, so the NCT here. Uh, so I was gonna ask, like, what is it like? What's the biggest challenge in any? You said the biggest challenge in what? Being an NEU, uh, any dial, like what's your biggest challenge? With it being my dominant function, I would say the fact that I can't turn it off. It, I, I think mm -hmm. dominant functions are a double-edged sword in that like they work to such a huge advantage, but also because you can't turn them off, it's overworking, it's it's overclocking you, especially at times when you really just don't want to use it. So if you're working on your NI nemesis, like basically trying to work with what's available right then and there, right? Because NI usually comes with SE pairs, so it's like whatever your experience is. If you're just working with whatever is on the table in front of you to make things happen, an NE won't let you do that all that well. It's going to look for things that don't mm. pertain to your situation, which is why like STs have issues with us for the most part, right? It's it's real difficult for us to focus on what's here and now half the time. Mm. So like, okay, that makes sense because I do know, like they would tell. I remember uh, hearing about ENTP talking about he struggles at parties or something like this. Yeah. You know, he's an extrovert because he doesn't. Is he not in the moment? He doesn't know how to get put himself in the moment sometimes or something like this. Mm -hmm. Um. So that's definitely interesting. Uh, also, I'll tell you, so I got another question. Why Why do you think any, like I always see any as being good at just thinking of jokes at any time. Why do you think that is? Like, or is that true? Or is that just like an assumption? We find different angles to to pontificate. Just to like word things and witty means is just finding a different way of saying something that anyone would say or anyone would think. So our ability to like associate words usually comes in handy for that. Uh, you were asking about NE specifically for now. Uh, the last thing was what? Mm, being funny, like our yeah, wit. Okay. Well, I got a good question for you, NE. Okay, so. I was thinking of this scenario last night. I think it was my NI. Mm. Uh, are you good now? Yeah. Okay. So, you know how, like, you know how they, like, say Adam and Eve? They, you know how the theory Adam and Eve theory, like, in religion, Christianity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so what if, all right, what if instead of Adam and Eve, we just had 16 types starting out? And all the, save like all, the all of them. Like all of them? Yeah, save all the things with men and all the, all the, all the women with fillers. How do you think, like, what do you think will happen? Like, do you think that would be a good way to start a society? Like, mm, and I see why you could you could see that as a possibility. Not you specifically, but like a person could see that as a possibility as as being viable. Um, do I think it's a great idea for the beginning of time? Probably not. It'll probably perpetuate a lot of the things that we have in society now, but earlier at a time when we didn't really understand ourselves. And so we couldn't really do anything to moderate that. And that'll probably turn into like mass chaos immediately. But I think there had to be like a balance from the beginning all the way out to now. Right. You couldn't have all of one thing be any like all of one type couldn't be a monopoly on any gender or any authority level or category or anything like that there had to be like mm -hmm. certain outliers to allow for certain things to happen later in life and making all the men thinkers and all the women feelers probably wouldn't have been the greatest thing um at the time because mm -hmm. then you have to think about it like all the feeling types right they have certain things in common in the way that they act and if that's the case you have to consider like the ramifications of that, like the negative ramifications of that. Like maybe, maybe the women just feel like they don't want to have sex and there's literally just the eight of them. We just stopped one generation in because they didn't feel like it. And the guys thought it wasn't prudent to just like take them, you know? So now it's like, okay. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. It could go any type of way. That's a lot. I don't think that's a great situation. I think diversity is necessary. Yeah. Definitely. I don't know. That was the answer. I was just thinking about that. I don't know why I just popped up. Yeah. But, uh, no, it was good. Uh, it was interesting. Yeah. But, um, okay, so, like, I know I was talking about before, like, are you talking about how sometimes you can go and, like, forget about your bodily needs? Stuff like that. Yeah. How, like, I mean, I, it's not a bad thing. I just, I just couldn't imagine. I just, I just didn't thought it was so different for me. You know what I'm saying? Um, how do you, like, for me, like, I can't imagine not being a, a sensor. You know what I'm saying? Right. Not being in touch with your surroundings like, and your body. Yeah. So, what is that like for you? Could you imagine being a sensor? Like, you think you could imagine it as an intuitive? Well, being an MCU, I mean, we all use all eight functions. I'm pretty, I mean, I, yeah, we all use all eight functions. I'm pretty sure you're able to, if you think long enough, you could, like, if you meditate on long enough, you could probably imagine it a little bit, like, what it's like being an MCU, you know what I mean? Wouldn't take long. Um, because remember, all right, so the whole bodily senses thing rooted from me saying, if I recall right, in our, in our past conversations, um, for me saying that I have an ability, most ENTPs have an ability, most NTPs have an ability to just like forego their bodily needs in order to complete whatever their personal interest is. Most TPs are able to do that to a degree, but NTPs are just easier going with that task. So it's like I could if I really forced myself. If I really had something, I could. But right, you can. Because your SE is so high. But then the flip side of that, right? My SI being at the bottom of my primary four uh, cogs and then it being the child function of an INTP, maybe them less so. So an ENTP would probably be most likely to do this of all the types. However, with differences, various differences. However, we also talked about how certain functions act like they're inverse in a different order. Therefore, if an SI is at the bottom of my top four functions, it would act like an SE when I do actually turn it on and I use it in a positive manner. So at that point, I have to get in, involved, like physically involved in something so I can gather information, right? But every other time, it's like null and void. So that SE turns all the way off at that point. Right. That SI that acts like an SE turns all the way off, which means now it's cognitively possible for me to go full NE and then explore mentally and then ignore my body. And I don't do that consciously. I just do it. So when you were asking about the NE um, drawbacks, that would be one of them. The fact that we are able to go abstract to the point where it's almost like astral projection, but you're inside your own body. You can, you, you're like aware or whatever, right? But the fact that you're hungry, the fact that you're tired, the fact that your eyes um, go dry and whatever else, like they're straining or whatever, it's more like, okay, cognitively speaking, because that T is still there, I need to back up, reset, and then come back. But it'll be like a 10 minute break instead of two days or two hours like it's supposed to be. To, to maintain health. Um, and so your brain kind of overrides your bodily needs and it makes it real easy for you to like ignore it. But if I was to try to be a sensor, even to think about it, I would have to develop my SI if I was to actually do it um, to the point where instead of it only turning on that SE functionality, in those select moments where my SI is positive, it's now more positive more often, or I use it more often, like all the time, maybe, right? So then it's me diving in to get information through firsthand experience instead of being in my head, which is good, but me being way more streamlined and linear in thought, and so my critical thinking usually takes an imbalance. So whereas I'm able to do certain things in a witty way, I'm able to do certain things in a free uh, floating way, that doesn't really stand if I try to use my sensory. Um, so I lose some of my charisma 
at that point, I would probably lose some of my um, decorum, like whatever way you'd be used to hearing me speak or seeing me write or this, that, and the third, it's now way more strict. It's way more rigid because it's only based on what I've experienced or what experiences I've drawn on. And that's it. Like, that's it. If it's not on the table in front of me, then, right? Because then that ties into SI at the inferior, acting like SE at the dom, which also has an NI, right, tied to it. So now if it's not on the table, and then that NI is inferior in that situation. So now it's like I'm really bad at the whole NI nemesis situation. So now you have a quartet, NE, SI, SE, NI, and all of it says, I'm trying to not repress this, but not lean on this. I'm trying to lean on this. For that to happen, this, this ratio starts to dwindle, it starts to change, right? And at that point, I started leaning on, um, say, my super ego, ESFP. That's what that looks like. So like an ENTP trying to do like... It's a little function, right? That's, that's your very, you know, bottom, like, just like I'm at bottom of my You're blind. Okay. Yeah, your blind spot or your demon function or whatever. But um, there's like two different types of demon functions. But in this aspect, it's, that's your demon function. Uh, what happens is you're trying to enlist your super ego in a positive way. Which we talked about before. That's possible. It's just going to take a lot of work. And when it happens, you take points away from like your whole ego situation. So whatever you know about an ENTP to be the common, the stereotype, even in a healthy state, that's now detracted so much so that it's less apparent that they're an ENTP and now easier to confuse them with either an INTJ, ISFJ, or ideally an ESFP. So you have ENTPs who act like the hedonists in certain situations, that's them using your ESFP, superego. So that's what it looks like when an ENTP is trying to do the whole sensory thing. Like, lead with it. Hmm. Interesting. Um, also, okay, I got a question, too, another one. Um, I've noticed, like, I don't know if this might, this might be an SC thing, or it could just be a, I don't know. Like, I know me, I think my SC makes me like wide open spaces and stuff like that. Mm. You know? I like watching movies with fight scenes and wide open spaces. And, like, I don't know. Like old school, uh, like I kung fu like, movies. Old school kung fu movies had yeah, like the like wide expanses in the background. Z, you know what I'm saying? You know, like Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Like, huge wide open space fight scenes. And, you know, uh, I know with any, I know some any users that seem like they like, like stuff that they like, learn about stuff in water, like water creatures and, uh, I don't know, like, they like Aquaman and stuff like that, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I, they seem to like stuff aquatic. They like learning about aquatic aquatic creatures. I've noticed that in some of the indie users I've known. I don't know if that's a thing. It might not be. A, I don't know, I'm trying to see if that's a pattern or not. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Um. So, like, in general, like, if they have certain surroundings that they are privy to or like to think about, or do you mean, like, an elemental, like, Affiliation. Yeah, they like the element of water. Like, I've known any user that like to swim and stuff like that. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, if that's yeah. true, why do you think that would be? Yeah, I mean, I swim like a dolphin. I, I like the concept of water being free and fluid and also yeah. having a sense of resistance. And if you push too hard, then that maybe, that might have made it like, it's representative of a person. Yeah, but I, I don't think about it in association to myself. Um, but that's probably just because I haven't, right? Somebody else might have, and then if they're an NE dom or parent, auxiliary, uh, then of course it would make sense that they could draw that connection and be like, I like this element because it's representative of me. But for someone like an ENTP, in most cases, they could probably make that connection to any element or surrounding, right? Because I'm an urban person. I prefer the city to a rural environment. However, I do like the idea of camping. I do like the idea of fishing. It's not just because I'm from Louisiana. It's because I've been through Boy Scouts and I don't know how many field exercises and deployments and this, that, and the third. And that means I'm, I'm adept at doing these things through trial and experiment. And then those skills I've honed, I like the opportunity to use them. 
right? So that's definitely an N-E-T-I thing. It's not like a sensory-based situation for me, but it leads to sensory-based activities. And so I draw more about the skills necessary to traverse that situation into my person than I do about the environment into my person, if that makes sense. Like an ISFP will be like, okay, I like such and such surroundings. I like trees. I like certain uh, weathers and atmospheres because it feels good. I like to see the birds. I like to hear this. I like to whatever, right? Whatever that is. However, an INTP might receive that same information and think about their personal interests in relations to that and say, this is why I, I enjoy that, right? Or their personal comforts. It it feels good, but more than the sun on my skin and this, that, and the third, it's a place where I can calm my nerves. I can calm my brain. I can stop thinking for a second. There's fewer immediate consequences to the situation. There are different ways that I can manipulate my surroundings to make myself more or less comfortable. I enjoy that control, uh, especially as an INTP. That means SI child, you kind of need certain things to be in a certain way. Mind you, if you're in the wilderness as an INTP, no one's asking you to clean up after yourself. You know, it's more about like the taskings and the skills and how you use them that we care about in those situations. So like environments and terrains and stuff like that, we will have our, our interests. But for the most part, I couldn't see us being like, it's because we feel as free as the air or we zip around mentally or even actively like electrons in a light bulb or things of that nature because we could do that for everything so you know i was watching uh you know somebody i think is an ENTP. you might be surprised i mean i think you might have to watch to actually know i'm not even a religious person i do watch certain religion religious type things sometimes i'm like i say i'm more spiritual person Mm-hmm. Like, I'm saying, you know, do things, spirituality. If I was thinking TDJ, I think he's an ENTP. Might be surprised, but if you go watch me, you'll see what I mean. You see what I say, but because when you break stuff down, it's pretty, you know. Definitely an EN. Be, you know yeah, he's definitely an EN of some kind. Yeah. I don't know. I would have yeah, a look maybe, at that. Maybe you have to. Yeah. Yeah, you should go. I mean, if you got a chance, look at an interview him or something, man. He really be like, I think he's a TI user actually. Mm. Um, it's, it's it's a little surprising, but when I started watching, I'm like, you know, kind of interesting. Um, like, who are your favorite ENCP like celebrities that you can recall? Like, like you think of ENCPs? I don't have a favorite ENCPs outside of like characters, and even then, I don't have favorite ENTP characters. I have like favorite ENTP shows. So like the Great Pretenders, uh, favorite show of mine, but it's an anime. It's on Netflix. Um, I like characters like how Sherlock Holmes was portrayed in Holmes, even though Sherlock Holmes' character is not an ENTP. Um, and for that, I could say maybe Robert Downey Jr. Jr. is one of them, but only because he naturally does that, right? Uh, Ryan Reynolds, for instance, like these actual ENTPs that this. I mean, my favorite is probably Iron Man. I like Iron Man ENTP. Yeah. Know. And then like Tony Stark. Like, if you're in the comics, it makes more sense that you will like his character as an ENTP if you just like that in a character, like ENTP-ness. But outside of actually being into the comics, you don't really pay attention to how he does certain things or why he does them or why he's an alcoholic or his relationship with his father or why he made this decision in Superior Iron Man or whatever, right? Like, these are things that would zip right past you and there's a reason for all of that and it's him using his ne in order to make sense out of certain things that most people would not make sense out of in the same ways and his ti allows him to pull triggers that most people don't want to pull like yelling face first at odin for instance which is like a stupid idea but it worked out in his benefit um this is for people who actually know what the the storylines for these things are the the point is though like if you if you came to a character like that and you didn't understand anything about like an ENTP or things typical of people that classify as ENTPs, then he just looks like an asshole that makes stupid decisions every once in a while and gets lucky with his brain, which is like how people look at ENTPs anyhow, right? 
for an ENTP who knows everything about himself, or at least most of it, you look at another ENTP and you're like, okay, it's not really a mirror, but you're not enthusiastic about it. You're not really impressed about it. You're like, okay, it's just another, there's nothing new here. Like your NE kind of takes over at that point. Yeah. So, like, I do that with INTPs, ENTPs, to an extent, ENTJs, only the, the thing about them is they make themselves super unavailable at certain points, and that keeps a little bit of mystery there. It kind of <clears throat> drives you to want to spend more time with them. ENTJs? Yeah. But in oh. general, I just, like, I'm... It's not that I'm unfascinated with them, but I'm unfascinated with them because I'm so familiar, you know? Yeah. So, like, you ask me if I have an ENTP favorite character or, or actor or anything like that, it'll lean towards the character side, the ones that you can just make stuff up about, and so you don't really have a template for that, as opposed to an actual actor or celebrity or this, that, and third, and then you're like, okay, well... I've known as much as I'm going to know about this person or I care to know about this person and that's about the end of that. There's nothing left to learn. I'm good on that. Like, I don't. My favorite celebrities are more like... It's not type-based, you say? They're Fs. My favorite celebrities are mostly Fs. They're, they're, they could be. They could fit in a type. It's just they're mostly Fs. Like, I like I some ISF. Like, Say again? Yeah. I said, so you just don't, like, worry about it. You don't, like, really, you know, type alerts like that. Huh? No. I do it for fun. I mean, I don't really, you know, I don't take that seriously. I do it for fun, but I do it with people I can observe, right? So as far as celebrities go, you never know exactly how much is actually them or not. Right. So if you try to type Kanye, he's obviously ENTP, but then you're like, okay, if you try to do an Enneagram on him, it kind of dips because he's not in a healthy state. Um, most of the time we see him when he is in a healthy state, we don't usually get to see him. The things we get to see him do are either literally for a performance or he's trying to get somebody's attention or he's going around about way of uh, supporting this person. So he can platform for this person getting out of jail, things of that nature. It's like really hard to really, it's like a uh, like mental I gymnastics. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, it's like a mental gymnastics? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, me personally, I feel like I'm, I think I'm able to tell this from, I don't know, I'm observing. I like doing it, so I don't know. Mm. I think I've, I've, uh, that's one of the main parts that I really go to to figure out first. I'm like, is this really, is it, you know, really? Now, I look at it from different angles and stuff, but, you know. Yeah. It's cool, though. Like, even if they're not showing it, like, even if they're not showing their real self, I think after a while you kind of can tell either way. Like, you can tell this is just, this based on how developed. Like, when you can tell how developed, uh, what a developed function looks like. Yeah. Uh, like, if you know what fully developed function looks like versus a function that's, like, not fully developed, it kind of helps and stuff like that. And it's like the, like, this my the, the contrast, the comparison. Yeah, like... I see introverts thinking that an ESFJ looks different introverts thinking than me, of course, right? So, like, they're using it. They could be using it, but I know it's not there. You can tell it's not developed. Like, stuff like that helps when you're talking about. Well, you know, you know, a uh, personality has to call that passive typing, you know, where you uh, type people just off observation, and they say active typing is when you're talking to them, asking them direct questions, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how they type. Direct or yeah. indirect information, yeah. Yeah, they were saying that active typing kind of can cloud your judgment on passive typing sometimes because you've seen it from, I don't know, just from asking people, it can kind of like, it's different, it's two different, kind of just a little different, you know? So, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's interesting, though. Mm -hmm. Like, it's very interesting for me. I don't know. I like that side of it. Um, I know ENTPs are very curious people, like, I like to explore different ideas mm -hmm. a lot, and uh, I know y'all in technology. Um, y'all, uh, uh, so I, I guess ISFJs and ENCPs are like fascinated by each other because y'all like different, so different from each other. 
and stuff like that. I think he either just always obsessing over he, it's just vice versa. Like um like I was telling you how my uncle the eyes of Jay, he was fascinated with Patrice O'Neill. Yeah. Patrice O'Neill, who I think is the ENTP. Um he's a funny he's funny though. I like his dark humor and stuff like that. Yep. Um so like you got you, you I think you did mention some a couple of eyes of Jay before, like so what's your dynamic with ISFJ? You can go over that again, even though we talked about it, you know. Uh, so ISFJs, I I think there is a commonality with certain types, right? Um, amongst them, for the ISFJ, I think there's a fair amount of them that are usually really attractive, especially in their prime, right? And ENTPs have... If, if you can make them, give them some type of like, sex appeal or something, like that. Yeah, they're they're usually amply blessed in certain ways or, or another, right? And then they're usually like well constructed, if you want to put it that way, or whatever the case may be. Like some political term, I don't care. The point is that kind of like hits the first ticker for certain ENTPs. I'm not gonna say all of us or anything like that. And it might sound toxic, but it's really like a healthy thing in this way. It's us trying to we operate on two different like paces, frequencies almost, but paces, right? So in the immediacy, we try to get like, and I think I said this backwards last time. In the immediacy, we try to get like all the crap off to the side so that we don't have to deal with it. It's personal comfort, right? In the long term, like lifelong grand scheme of things, we're trying to do all the difficult stuff up front so everything after is just cake. Therefore, we get all the shallow, all the, the difficult social environments, all the difficult social interactions out of the way immediately. Different ideologies and why they can be cohesive or why we should or shouldn't, we handle all that immediately, right? So with the ISFJ, being attractive, that's like check one almost automatic, like automatically, automatically, almost automatically. Um, and of course, that's not unilateral, but by and large, they usually are attractive in their prime. So that's cool or whatever. Um, so that's an easy check. Uh, the reverse, I could see an ISFJ seeing ENTPs as, um, at the very least, attractive enough to be seen with them in public. Right? <laughs> that's how I like to put that. Um, I think they like y'all like wittiness and stuff like that. Right. They're usually more attractive, at least in my perspective, what I've seen, right? And then what I've witnessed of other people's observations. They seem to be way more um, attracted to us mentally. Yeah, the fact that we think differently kind of ticks certain boxes for them. The fact that we can make it seem okay for them to do certain things that within their system they previously thought were uh, unrighteous. uh, I think they like that. It adds to their to their shelter, right? It makes that home base that they need to operate from a little bit larger. It makes it okay to expand a little bit more, dip into different topics, and then increase your own knowledge. Therefore, the ISFJ has an opportunity with his ENTP to get smarter, have more confidence in their own ability, have more competence in different fields, and diversify. And with all of that, it roots back to them having a larger like home base to work with, right? Now they have a sense of righteousness that is based in self instead of system, or at least more so. It leans more so, right? Um, I think that personal growth that we offer for pretty much any partner, if we're healthy and if we know what we're doing, we have self awareness and we're working on our self realization all the way out to actualization, and we're helping so and so do the same because that's what we want to do. EP, we're helping, we're giving. And then NT is going to be in a mental way, in a mental capacity. So we're literally helping your brain grow. Um, with TP, our skills, and in and EN in like a explorative way. So we're literally helping your brain grow skills or a different skill set in like a multitude of, of, of ways, right? And we're being very energetic about that. And ISFJs love the affection that comes across when they receive that is what I realized. Yeah. It's yeah. it's a roundabout way of being very affectionate and nurturing and caring. And they love that. Yeah, that's my 
That is nice, like, because I've, okay, I've been in a couple situations with Isaac Gates. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say a bunch, but I've been, I know, yeah, I get that. Um, I got, like, two more questions. Have at it. Oh, there is the flip side of that, like how how that continues on the other side of that. Um, so they spend too much time together. That can go real corrosive real quick. Um, at first, you have like this strong, strong puppy dog phase. And then after a while, you start to hone in on the differences. And the ENTP's natural tendency is to try to make connections of those differences. The ISFJ, being an IJ, has a natural tendency to um, scare away from change. Uh, Not, ooh, pardon me, a little piggy. Not because they can't, but because it's uncomfortable. Um, Like I said, it's about confidence. They have no confidence in something they haven't personally experienced or they don't have like a system that tells you this is what the experience should look like. Here's what right looks like, blah, blah, blah. It's how they, ooh, gracious, that damn Tic Tac. It's how they validate their actions, right? If it's right or wrong, they focus on morality. So between their morality and an ENTP is like, okay, I just want you to be better. I want you to improve. I want you to get to your goal and their ability to NT pull the trigger as necessary. There becomes that imbalance between an ISFJ having their own dark jokes every once in a while and now having to actually act on some of those dark jokes where an ENTP will be like, nah, bro, certain situations will allow for that to be the case. And it's okay. And ISFJ will not be comfortable with that because they've not done that. And so that'll create a schism, right? So an ENTP can be too adventurous for ISFJ and an ISFJ can be too sheltered, but that's what that looks like. That's why. Okay. Okay. And uh, I don't want to create any more controversy for you, but... I was gonna ask about how your like you said your son's an ISTP. Before we we can explain a little bit and so people don't get yeah you know confused about that. But there's more people. I made a video on my channel talking about it mm. a little bit. And people would receptive. I there's saw only it. like a couple of ignorant people that are on you know yeah I saw it's it. Like a, if you explain it properly, there's only a couple of ignorant people that are gonna take it and be like oh you try to project and this and that. Um, but I'll tell you right now, I'm, look, for me being an ISCP, like, from what I can remember, I'm talking about my earliest memories are from, like, two years old. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's from my earliest memories. Mine's are three. And from there, I was using this word of thinking, like, I'll tell you right now, my uh, first interest was, as an introvert of thinker, was, I remember there's like, a handyman used to come over and fix stuff, and I would always want to go watch him. Mm. See how, what he do to fix stuff. So you pick I up the skills. I would be fascinated. I try to play with tools. I get in trouble trying to play with tools and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, like, even then, I'm like two, three years old, man. Like, so it's like, I think it starts pretty early. It's just people are just unaware. You know what I'm saying? And different stages you go through, you look like different types, different points in your life, you know. That's just what I think. But, uh, like, what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Like, as far as your son, you think he's an ICP, like, um, just your thoughts and like, why do you think he's an ICP? I'm just curious, you know. So, um, you know, I don't, mean, I don't meet a lot of them. So, so taking notes, I, I take notes with everything. Um, at least most conversations. Oh, yeah. Uh, so right. right off, there was child uh, typing, right? My brother does that too. He's an ITJ. I probably SIME thing. My brother take notes, but he take notes on like to do lists and stuff. Like right, it, it's it's for them. It's a little bit different in like why they do it. It's easier to make yeah. something happen if you have like a tangible list. You have something to go off of. So it's literally like them making a, a standard of operations for everything they do. It's it's just an SOP that they're writing down. It's like making a policy. For me, my memory sucks. It just makes more sense to write down all these to record all these um, reference points. And then it'll help me remember what I was doing. And then it's like a little bit of sensory that I need for my SI that allows me to continue doing the NE thing. So you hear about ENTPs having like a web in their brain and that's what their brain looks like. That's how their mind works, right? Which synapses are technically a web in everybody's head, but whatever, right? Ours is a little more complex than most people's because of our NE. 
for us to expand that or to traverse that, we kind of need to make marks in the tree as we go through the woods, kind of. That's what my lists are, right? Um, you were talking about child typing, and then you said, what else after that? I'm making those so I can make sure I, I touch those. You hit child typing, um, ISTP, and then what else? I was just, I was just saying, like, what's, like, what's your thoughts on your son being an ISTP and, you know, what kind of brought you to that conclusion as of, like, right now? Yeah, you had two other ones after that. If I can remember, I'll, I'll say it do, during this because they were definitely worthy of response. Um, all right, so for the typing. Oh, yeah. Have it. So I can write it down. What's up? Oh, no, I was just, I thought I remembered, but I didn't. I was, I heard okay, just in case you do. Was, I don't know. In case you do, right? Maybe while I'm talking, you'll, you'll remember it. So. I forget stuff I think, too. I'm not, maybe not, like, sometimes I, I stuff slip my mind, so I don't know. Mm. Like, so, um, ISTPs uh, have certain traits, just like any other type does. And you can start to recognize them with the beginning of your uh, cognitive functions development, right? So how I said self-awareness, yeah. that was the other thing. It was cognitive development you tapped on. You didn't say those yeah. words, but... Oh, yeah. That was one of them. So... Oh, yeah, yeah, we developed that yeah, different Right. So what you can do is start to notice as they start to use their cognitive functions, what similarity similarities there are in their actions, their choices, how they exhibit certain emotions, blah, blah, blah. Right. Now, of course, depending on what their type is. Um, and again, it's not the type that makes the brain. It's the brain that makes the type. That's a given. I don't think that should be necessary to say, but it should be said to certain individuals like you mentioned. Right. Um, yeah. If you look at a child, I said yesterday, added that. I was going to add something to it to make it. Somebody told me yesterday that your temperament molds your response to experiences, not the other way around. That's what somebody said yesterday. So it made that that's good. Like temperamental responses that might tie in. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, yeah, it has it, 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 you know, your response to situations. It's an inhibitor. It's, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so. To type a child, you recognize the earlier signs and the earlier the better, but um, cognitively speaking, it's whenever they start developing awareness of their situation themselves, etc. They're going to start to exhibit traits that say, I'm leaning towards this action. When they're leaning towards this action, that's their favorable action. It's their nature coming out. They haven't learned anything and a little bit of nurture that comes from the environment in which they're in shapes what they have to react to but how they react is based on their nature at this point right they don't have a society telling them this that and the third they're not even aware of what these words mean for the most part for the very beginnings of their life and so it's it's the purest form of them exhibiting whatever right so there's a double-edged sword there um where one you could say if a person's balanced with all of their cognitive functions they don't lean with any of them then how could you tell and then there's the other one it, it's like well flip side of that extreme is they haven't developed any of them how could you tell like i said over time you're going to start to see that dominant function pop up right if you look at a child's development they start they start recognizing their feet they start recognizing their hands balls they put things in their face they recognize they have a face to put things in they recognize that certain things taste good certain things don't certain things are food some of them aren't i can't eat my dad's nose i can't eat my mom's hair unless it's not in her head stuff like that they're going to start recognizing that if the kid tries to yank stuff off your head that's what they did they realize they can't eat it when it's on your head so um they're learning and as they learn they become more uh, whatever their dominant function is, you start to see more of that. You can actually recognize that as early as two years old. That is apparent. Mm -hmm. And you really should be able to recognize that beforehand, but for a pattern, you have to have at least two instances of, a, of an occasion, right? And the more instances of that occasion that exists, the better your pattern, the stronger your pattern. So you can actually confirm certain like expanses of MBTIs that are more or less likely, right? It's literally process of elimination. And I don't think anyone can argue that actually works to a degree. Is it the best method? No. Can it be adjusted later? Yes. That's why it's okay. That's why it's acceptable. 
Th that's why it's acceptable. So you're starting with a dominant function that you start to recognize in how your child leans um, in their interactions. Then they're going to start working on their parent function around like toddler age, right? This is when they start to protect themselves. This is literally the parent function, your auxiliary, your second function. This is how they um, or what they base their defenses on. So some kids will sit here and strike other kids or an adult or a dog or whatever the case may be. Some kids will run away from them. Some kids will um, cry as soon as they feel like there might be a problem. That is an FI parent, right? A, a person who's going to hit might be an SE parent or uh, something that's physical, right? A person who needs to yell at a person might have an SI parent as a child. These are tell signs and you're like everyone does that duh everybody has all eight functions right it's a matter of which one they lean towards so uh you keep going through until they hit adulthood and then their awareness is one thing right but by the time they're say in their early 20s it is not about the age it's about the experience but the amount of time that you spent on earth should inhibit how much experience you can and can't have right so by the time they're in their early 20s like say 23 4 or 5 they're supposed to be aware at the very least of their upper four cogs and that doesn't mean you know mbti that means i know i like to make connections any i know i like to defend my logic with logic or I like to pick on other people's logic, for instance, to help it, right? And that's my way of helping the tribe, F-E. Maybe I like um, to have very specific things a specific way, and it may not make a lot of sense to other people, but it makes perfect sense to me, low S-I, right? And then I'm aware that these are things about me. So I don't originally say, okay, I have T-I, I have F-E, but I do originally say I want for the group and I want what makes sense, right? Logic, tribe, F-E, T-I. You, sh you should know these things about yourself by the time you're an adult. That is self-awareness. The better awareness you have to like what your triggers are, what your incentives are, what your motivations are, the more self-awareness you've achieved. That's a spectrum. It's not like a specific point, right? Just like it's a spectrum for recognizing things in a child. So when you're talking about child typing, it's the beginning of a process. And if you're observant enough and the child exhibits enough and they're comfortable enough to be themselves, then yes, you most certainly can see the beginnings of that pattern right back then. Um, now I say two, uh, two years old for a reason. Um, Mary, what's her name? Mary Franz, such and such. It's in my phone. <laughs> Duh. And I thought I was going to say too, like, like me personally, like the way I was raised, it made my SC kind of repressed. You know what I mean? Mm. So, yeah, my parents didn't want me to, like, but my mom, she didn't, like, want me to do stuff that was my SC. Like, and that's the kind of want to do. Yeah. You didn't get it. Yeah, that's but, common. Mary Louise Von Franz. According to some people's logic, that would mean I would change types, right? No. That well, means I'm going to a different type. Yeah, some but, people would say that. You know what I mean? Like, but that wouldn't change your type. That would just change the quadrant of your mind that you're accessing at that point, right? And we'll talk about that. So exactly. that was the third thing. Thank you. Ah, um, quadrants. Quads. And also, too, I was going to add, too, it takes too long to develop functions for you to just be like, oh, I'm a, you know, I don't know. Maybe that might not be a good point. I don't no, know. that is a good I was point. Thinking too, like, it kind of takes too long for you to develop functions for you to just be like, I'm writing this person's name oh, down. Like, yeah, that's a great uh, point. Uh, so it takes too long. Like, yeah. One moment. Let me finish writing these names down in this like title. Me, that's like saying I probably like I would be more familiar with. I feel like I'd be more familiar with my uh, bottom. Like if I, I would probably be a little more familiar with it if we was able to switch types like that. Like I'm, I have no Psh, idea. I wish. I like to be you know what I mean? Like, excuse me, Bert. I can think about it. And I can imagine just from, because we all use all of the functions at some point, mm -hmm. but I still, it's very hard for me. You know what I'm saying? I had to really think about it and really think about times I've used it and stuff like that briefly. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then expand upon it. 
And then the fact, like, personality hacker, they call stuff the 10-year-old process. I can't remember specifically, but they call them different age. Like, just they call the function. The baby, the 10-year-old, the parent, and the hero. Yeah. Um, the, the... Yeah. Spouse and the... Like, I don't know. The 10-year-old process, yeah. that's because you have whatever that function is as your 10-year-old process. You have it developed at the level at which someone that's 10 years old with that dominant function has it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think I think that's what it's based. If I'm not mistaken, it's something like but that. I haven't heard it in a high second. Like it takes time to develop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, yeah. Huh. Mary Louise von Franz is the name I was looking for. This lady studied with Carl Jung, like directly under him, knew him personally, et cetera, et cetera. Saw his relationship with uh, Sigmund Freud freaking capitulate. And um, has studied with him to a degree that most people in the world won't ever have the opportunity to do, right? So by all rights, she's essentially the world's foremost expert on Jung's work. But, but I'm, I'm sure there might be exceptions, but as far as I know, right? She and James Hillman wrote a book called uh, Lectures on Jung's Typology. In that book is the excerpt that I pulled and put in that post that you were talking about, uh, about the, the ISTB child typing thing, right? So it wasn't about that, but people made it about that. But that is a source. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's what I said, too. It's like, it wasn't even about that. Like, people, like, nitpick about dumb shit. And I said that multiple times in the post. I was like, that's that's irrelevant as all hell. I mean, we could have that conversation. I'm not I running from it, but. Just because I knew they might see it. If you saw, I kind of was trolling myself a little bit just because I knew they might see it. Yeah, I saw that in the, uh, in the, the other video, the one that you just put. Yeah. I was just saying shit just to piss people off, actually. I wasn't really, I didn't mean all that. I was just yeah. saying shit. But, um, it's good to clear that up. That way you can go on record saying that. Not that it's super important, but just in case. Anyway, uh, long and short of it, right? A child begins to become aware. They start to lean towards certain activities that are associated with functions. Then they develop the ability to defend themselves and strike out or run or cry or however they're going to react, right? That's their parent function. Eventually, they're going to have certain desires. They're going to be like, I want this. I want that. But specifically, like non-survival, just interest or personal comforts or whatever that might look like. That'll be your child function. Eventually, they'll have certain things that are very very particular to them but it only pops up once in a blue moon that'll be their inferior that's the pattern set that you're looking for right that can develop as early as like five all four of them by the time you're in kindergarten you use and this is america in kindergarten in germany like mary louise von franz is where i got the number two from as far as two years right in Germany, kindergarten starts at like three years old. So they said at least a year before kindergarten is when you can pick up some of these traits, i.e. two years old, basic math. However, it, it's on a spectrum. It doesn't say they hit two years old and now boom, 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 right? Age is less important than experience. So you have a shut-in child. You may not see any of that stuff happen until four, eight years old. Or if you have an exceptionally well-experienced child, which they've only been on the planet for so long then you're going to see something like two three years old maybe four years old right um by the time my kid turned four i had already seen a lot of this stuff happen for years so people are like how can you tell as if i just popped up one day looked at my kid and was like you're an istp and then walked off and then on top of that people were in the comments like you can't raise them like that you can't steer them there. like i'm not I'm not choosing their type for them. They're showing me and I'm making an association and I do what I can according to what that might be. You think you're trying to force it on them? You think you're trying to force it on them or something? That's the thing. It's not bad to type a child. It's good. It's a great idea because it puts you in a position to better craft the things that you have for them for them. Right? The schools. Maybe it would have helped. With a lot of things with my like, the daycares, the like, study habits, the learning habits, the, the music you listen to, the music you expose them to, the environments you take them to, things that you think are personally okay or societally okay, communally okay, are not necessarily okay for that child. They're just there.
So if you're from Louisiana, you go to Bayou Classic, right? Bayou Classic is a huge football game over there. It's uh, Grambling State and uh, Southern University. So there's all types of hooting and hollering and lots of energy. It's almost like a second Mardi Gras. However, give or take. However, certain types of, of individuals progress and strive in those environments, and some of them hate it. It's like a personal hell. And it doesn't have to be a child, but in children, you can recognize that some of them flourish in those environments, child though they are, and some of them do not. And you're like, why did you bring your child to Mardi Gras? It's not actually Mardi Gras. It's just that a lot of the things you associate with Louisiana is there, like the daiquiris and the beads and the this, that, and the third. It's just a football game. If you tailgate it and you would bring a child to a tailgate, you would bring a child to Bayou Classic. Um, but essentially... You can bring that child to different experiences and then see how they react. And that will give you more data to work with as well. Um, cognitive development. Like I said, you start with. Yes. And you being in different environments would not have changed that. What would have happened was actually, let me get there later because the quads I'm going to do after I go through this whole cog development thing. Right. And I'll do videos on them at some point. For cognitive development, naturally, you're going to come across your first four. These are the ones that everyone stops paying attention to. These are the ones that your letters are based on, right? So you have ENTP, N-E-T-I-F-E-S-I. -E you're going to be aware of those hell or high water unless you become a vegetable or you have some type of deficiency or um, we'll say advanced capability, right? Or alternate capability. So then... Your lower stack, those are things that have been around just as long, but you didn't pay attention to them. These are the things that trigger you, the things that you're unable to do naturally, the things that you outright suck at, right? You have your nemesis, your critic, your um, trickster, and your blind spot, your, your demon function, which is just like a thing that trolls you, kind of. Um, if you're actually in MBTI, and you like to research, this is probably going to be the one that you find the hardest to understand. It's going to be between your nemesis or your blind spot. These are the two that are probably going to be the hardest for you to gather to like grasp what that looks like without external information. Um, but aside from that, there's what I'm referring to as integers where you have all eight of those in a specific order, and that's your positive half, that's your upper half. You can actually learn how to use your primary four cogs in the most positive, impactful way, and then learn how to not be triggered by your negative uh, or your secondary, uh, secondary stack, right? Your bottom four cognitive functions, your nemesis, critic, tri uh, trickster, and blind spot. Then if you reverse the order, you're now working on how to not allow other people to impact you with these uh, traits, right? Not to manipulate you with your, uh, with your lower, with your normal lower negative stacks, right? Um, but instead how to make a positive impact with those as well. So it's not just not being triggered. Now it's how do I use these, right? How do I use NI or TE, for instance? And then, which would previously be off your radar. And then at the very bottom, you're using your positive traits, but in a way that's not overbearing and negative for other people. So you have positive intents and then you do whatever that intent is or requires. And then other people are like, well, I had a negative impact from this, right? That wasn't your intent, but here's how you moderate it by working at that bottom portion. So you have your positive uh, integers and then your negative integers. And that's just how I'm referring to that. The reason they're in different orders is because once you get to a certain level of development, you are able to handle certain other things and it becomes easier or not, depending on your path to development, um, to work on specific ones. And it's actually the hardest to work on the first one you need to work on in your negative integers. And that's why it's probably supposed to be first. Right. So for me, that's what SE. For me to use SE as a negative energy, I'm learning how to use that in a positive way. So how you were saying beforehand. Right. What does it look like for an ENTP to. Everything's connected. Anyway, 
<laughs> what does it look like for an ENTP to act like, resemble, use sensory, right? Like a, a sensory lead. When you're working on your SE by that point, you've already got your awareness, got your realization, meaning you now know these things about yourself and know how to use them to a positive intent, but then, or at least how to use them, period. But then you're trying to use these portions to a definite positive intent. Uh, your SE is now, how do I immerse myself in something instead of just sitting around thinking about it, which is a common like shortfall for ENTPs, which is what I said beforehand, right? Uh, low SI. On top of that, it prompts you to now use your TE, no, FI, good Lord Jesus, it prompts you to use your FI, your FI says, what do I feel about what I'm taking in, how do I incorporate that in my value set, um, does this look righteous or not, right, is what I'm doing the right thing to do, then your morality starts to boost, right, then you have your TE, at that point, it looks like I'm going to make a good system for other people to use based on not only what I've experienced, but what right looks like, what mor like moral victories look like. Your NI then comes in and says, I'm going to do all of that, but I'm going to do it based on what's around me and just what's available, right? Um, instead of letting my NE go fucking haywire and... Now I'm back where I started, where I don't do any work. I just think about the work. So you're literally learning how to be productive at that point. Go figure. That is the ESFP's um, stack. So that's your super ego development at that point. Um, so that's the integers, right? And then you look at the quads, so the quadrants, and this is not like new information, I'm, I just re-encapsulated it, I'm going to put it in a video or something like that. Uh, C.S. Joseph was how I got the notion for the quadrants of your mind. However, what he did was he re-encapsulated himself uh, what Jung actually did. Like I said, you can look up some of this stuff and you can read it for yourself, but Anything in MBTI is just a re, a repackaging, a more user-friendly version of his notes. So you can say it's pseudoscience, this, that, and the third, but he literally came from the same schooling as, loosely, as uh, Sigmund Freud. So then for you to say, like, okay, it's psychobabble, okay, we know that you're probably lumping Freud's work in psychobabble, which means you probably don't believe in the ego, the id, the superego, which means you probably don't believe in the superego, the conscious, the shadow, and the ego. You probably wouldn't believe in any of those things, so none of this is really worth your time at that point. If you're not going to invest in it, you're not going to do the research, you're not going to apply it, you're not going to test it, verify it on your own, then, like... I guess it was like finding out your Harry Potter house. Like you did the thing. Okay, good for you. You can't do anything with this, but decorate your room, I guess. I don't know. You know, like if, if it's not for you, that's cool. It's not for you. But also like the people that will pop up in these comments and be all derogatory. I'm like, why? What do you get out of this? What? I literally ask people, what's your intent? And they think I'm being sarcastic. I'm like, no, nah, bro. I'm like, literally, like, what are you here for? Maybe I can help you get that so you can do something productive. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And then on top of that, ENTPs have like that whole troll stereotype. So not that it's not deserved, but that I think prefaces certain individuals, especially high NI users to come to the table saying, this is what I've, I've recognized, right? This is what I've experienced. This is what other people experience. This is all I know. This must be it. And instead of verifying, they ask, um, very sarcastic things that insinuate but they don't directly confront that that notion hey are you trolling no mm -hmm. okay i can't take that at face value because other people said no and they continued to troll and it was very obvious and apparent so rather they thought they were or not i felt it so you must be doing that same thing 
right? So when you get a healthy ENTP who's forced in that situation, depending on their availability to walk or if they've realized that there are things they can gain from that situation or not, that'll determine if they handle it well or if they perpetuate the stereotype. When I'm in those comments, I'm not trying to perpetuate the stereotype. I can see how people could receive that. And so I ask them questions. I just establish understanding if at all possible. And then it's a matter of if they're cooperative or not. Balls in their court from that point. Um, but the quads. So aside from all that, right, it's either for you or it's not. But it still applies. It's right. just math. It still applies. It happens either way. It's still stuff that happens. Like right. And the real reason it's pseudoscience now is because people can't verify. They can't verify it because you'd have to literally look at every brain, every mind, even the ones that don't work. Like you'd have to look at every mind and, and be like, OK, is this the case? Is this not the case? Which people don't realize that's literally all you do with any other theorem, uh, formula, factoid, etc. Right. You, It's a fact until it's not a fact. You just gather new information and you adjust it later. So if you can do that, you shouldn't have a problem with assimilating certain systems. I digress. For the quadrants, you have your ego, you have your super, or excuse me, subconscious, your shadow and your super ego. For the development path, you can start with your ego, which is probably what you should do, right? Because self-awareness, and then you learn how to use that, self-realization, and then you learn how to use that to a positive intent, and then you go out there and try to make sure that you don't get triggered by, say, your shadow. So then, from ego, you can go to your shadow. Your shadow is what you work on for partnership purposes. This is on an individual basis. You usually have the negative effect of that in a communal issue because you're not supposed to be using your shadow in a communal situation. That is reminiscent of your parent function. Right. So you have your four primary stack, right? Your, your, your four top cogs. If your ego is your dom or reminiscent of it, then your subconscious is your. Dang, I wrote that down. Uh, your subconscious is your F.E.S.I. Inferior. Is that right? Or is that wrong? It's either your inferior or your child. Let me finish the rest of it, and then I'll go back and redact that as necessary. Your parent is your shadow. I'm literally doing math in my head. Your, yeah, and your superego is your child. So it goes hero, inferior, parent. I know shadow, but I don't know what the specific terms for all of them sometimes myself, so. It's it's just recap because when you you I have it, I call it sometimes. right you have it it's just under what name right it, you already know it though, um, so your hero inferior parent and child are your ego subconscious shadow and super ego, essentially, right. So if you look at it that way, then your child being your super ego says, what the tribe wants. F.E. child ENTP is what the child or what the tribe gets. Right. And if you look at a super ego of an ENTP when they're using it in a negative way, because those top two, the ego and the subconscious are positive. The bottom two shadow is for protection when you're afraid. It's activated by fear and super ego is activated by anger. So it's literally retaliation. Then you get malicious compliance. Right. An ESFP in a healthy nature just wants to give. They, they want to be used. That's how they get their validation, right? But as a super ego for an ENTP, it looks like I'm done talking to you. I'm done associating with you. I'm done hearing you. I don't want you in my area. I don't want you near me. I don't want you to exist anymore. And if I have to give you something that I know doesn't make any sense to give you for your intent, for you to leave me the fuck alone, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you exactly what you asked for and then some. And then I'm going to let you see what the result is. And I'm going to let the world, the ENTP, let the world burn uh, uh, meme comes from an unhealthy ENTP living in their super ego. Right. This is when you salt the earth. This is when you burn everything, salt it, nothing regrows. This is me giving you everything I can think of and then some up to the extent in which I'm willing to go um, based on the situation or risk based on the situation uh 
and you're going to have all of it and you're going to deal with the outcome and you're not going to like it like I fucking told you and then I'm going to excommunicate you, right? But in a positive light, you learn how to give without overgiving, which ESFPs can be very overwhelming. You learn to accommodate per what is actually being asked instead of just offering what you know, which is the SF thing. Um, you learn to appropriate what you're giving in accordance with how the audience receives, right? So it's now not just the content that matches their intent, but instead it's the packaging, the delivery. So in a sense, that ENTP uh, crass, brass, asshole stereotype disappears when they develop their super ego. In other words, when they develop their FI and they feel like this is what right looks like, when they get a morality about them, when they start to care about the value set that they operate from, besides just ethics, it's now morals, right? So your FI is now working with your FE and it makes it easier for you to sympathize, to empathize, right? The best empaths that we have amongst the types are FI doms. The most patient and best listener is ISFP. The most well-wishing for other individuals with the most altruism by nature is the INFP. They're both FI doms. You know, like all this stuff works out one way or the other. It's just people don't want to look deep enough to figure it out. And so they stop at cursory levels and they're like, okay, this is a bunch of psycho babble and they keep it kicking. I'm like, if that's where you want to go, that's where you would go. I mean, people said the same thing about hydraulics at one point. Kind of explain to people real hard. Like, people that don't, I'm familiar with. I'm going to say, you don't have to, though. I'm trying to figure out more ways to be better at explaining it. You know, that's more of a skill in itself. Like, yeah, it is. Explain it. Yeah, it is. New people. But that's, again, if they want to receive it. I think a problem with a lot of things is um, that people make mandates out of suggestions. And by that, I mean things that should be able to fluctuate don't get that leeway nowadays. People need to stand on something, to believe in something. And that's great, but again, in moderation, right? You have to pick your battles. You have to figure out where you're going and how you want to get there, but also find alternate routes as necessary or be able to adjust accordingly. That way, if that plan doesn't work out or you're standing on something that turns out to be false or decrepit or whatever, you're not so attached to it, usually sentimentally or traditionally speaking, that you have no means or confidence or competence to adjust accordingly, to shift fire, right? When you make mandates out of things that should be suggestions, you're pigeonholing yourself. Not only that, but these are usually the types of individuals that end out or end up projecting those pigeon holding cages on other people and be like, no, this is what right looks like. It got the result. That's it. Why reinvent the wheel? Forgetting that the first wheel is a piece of fucking rock. This is how it's always been. But it's not always been that way because once upon a time, we couldn't speak. We didn't have fire. We didn't cook. We certainly didn't have shelters. We slept in bushes before we ever found a cave. Some of us didn't have caves available. It was the stars and grass if you were lucky. Some of us had clouds and ash, literally, you know? So tradition has a starting point. Accreditation has a starting point. Remember, I talked to you about that beforehand. I think accreditation is kind of, it has its purpose, but people put too much on it. And the terminology I used before was it's stupid. And that was a bad idea. It's smart, right? Accreditation, accreditation is just a voucher saying I have this much experience, this much research done. I understand to this degree or at least well enough to, to pass in society, right? But it's based on, look at me, fucking single observer acting like a conspiracy theorist, society. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but it's based on 
a central accreditation system, right? If you think about how that system began, none of the people at the round table or the council or the board that said, this is the accreditation we're going for. Here's the criteria. Here's what it's supposed to get us to do or to certify for. And here's where we can apply it. None of those people that were there were accredited. And you're like, of course not, because chicken and egg, you had to have something to hatch that. Nah, bro. Like, because they weren't accredited themselves you have an accreditation source that is based on people without that accreditation until after it was created and then they go back and go through it, right? So essentially, you're putting your TE accreditation faith in a system that was made by people who were unaccredited themselves. And that's arguable because you could say, well, these people had the knowledge base. They just didn't have a piece of paper that said that. So then when you come to the back end of that accreditation process, and it's been going for however many centuries, you now have NTs typically or NFs who are like, I have the knowledge base. I just don't have a piece of paper. And then the STs and SFs are like, well, that's not what we've been doing. This is what right looks like. We've always done this. Or I don't know. Maybe that's a, a possibility or, or cap maybe you're capable of making that happen, but I'm not comfortable with this, so just do the thing that makes me comfortable. And then the NFs are like, well, whatever gets the harmonious answer immediately, let's just do that. And then the NTs are like so scarce in the situation that they made the system, right? That accreditation board was almost certainly a bunch of NTs and STs, almost 100%. They made the system for what they were commissioned for, and then they disappeared. These were the group of people who had the knowledge and just not the piece of paper, by, by the way. That's the NTs. So they do all the stuff, and then they disappear, and when they come back to the situation, people are like, where's the papers? And the NT is like, I have all the knowledge. What are you talking about? And they're like, no, bro, you need the papers, period. It doesn't make any fucking sense. It's silly. I see what you mean by that now. I think I agree, and when you were saying it before, I was kind of like, I think introvert is nice word thinking. I'm trying, I don't know how to really explain it, but it's in some ways, I do. Try it, we'll connect the dots. Um, Try it. As far as accreditation, that's like me, as far as like, I was saying I got in the personal training. Yeah. I feel like me getting certified didn't really make a difference. It <laughs> because didn't. I already knew all this stuff anyway. So, you know what I mean? Is that what you mean? There are certain things that you picked up going through that process, right? But you may not have even used afterwards. That's a common complaint about high schools, especially in like first world areas. Is like, when am I going to use this? When realistically speaking, you could use some of that stuff just based on where you're going. If you already know where you're going and it doesn't require this stuff, then yeah, it's a big fucking waste of time. Or... If you know where you're going and the place that requires the stuff has waivers, it's still a waste of time. I'm in IT. I don't need a degree to do my job. I have certifications that I can obtain. I do the exam. I get my certification, which is still accreditation, right? But then I use that. So that's essentially a waiver saying, hey, in lieu of a four-year degree, you can have four or eight years or six years of experience, right? So those individuals that went through college and now have that school loan or they paid however much before they even went to school or they used up all their grants for this or this, that, and the third, and like whatever their situation is, right? They went through it. And at the end of the process, there's another guy who did not go through it, but because they joined the military, they had a fighter run situation where they were thrown in the fire and they got all the experience they needed to. So now when they get here, this person has a piece of paper and a book knowledge, but no practical skills. And then this other person has all the experience and is actually better at doing that task without the accreditation. But, yeah. you know, society yeah, says the accreditation is necessary. I'm like, eh. Yeah, that's the only reason I ever really seem like I really, like, I want the benefit from society knowing I'm qualified. I don't really care about actual, you know, accreditation. Because, like, my own, my thing is I start to realize at some point people are not going to think that you are, you're like, qualified unless they see some type of proof. And that. I always thought it was stupid, but... That's on them. I like if I just, 
demonstrating the skill and the build. And like, you know, I can show that I can do it. I can just be able to prove it. That should be enough. You know what I'm saying? But what yeah. if someone did that in a relationship? You know, mm. like there's right. that that red pill meme. Show me the whole facts. What if someone was like, real life, I need certification to say that you're not going to be a deadbeat, you're not going to be a bad co-parent, you're not going to be this, that, and the third, or you are going to be a provider, you are going to be secure, you are, you are going to be stable, you're going to be flexible, you're going to be able to be affectionate and nurturing and caring, but also, uh, did I say available? Available again, if I hadn't said it before, available. Um, all these things, right? Like if you needed a certification to say that. Like, how would that work? How would that roll over? I feel like that would get a lot of pushback at first. People still do that. People actually do that. Like, they actually act like you need some type of, like, I don't know, they, they may be attached to something else. They don't call it, like, not, they don't attach to a certificate, but they attach it to, I don't know, like. Flip side, flip side, you know what I'm saying? Like, you have individuals too. Like, you have individuals who are like, a date shouldn't be an interview. I'm like, no, every date's an interview. All interactions are interviews. Individuals who are like, a date shouldn't be an interview. I'm like, no, every date's an interview. All interactions are interviews. Like, it's an experiment right. like everything's an experiment and everything is an interview as far as interactions go like even with babies you're not talking to them but you're like okay let me get this information and figure out how i can best interact with this person boom interview done brass tacks that's all it is so on the one end people are like matters of sentiment should not be um regulated on another end you have individuals who are like accreditation is all that matters and then you have another spectrum who is uh cherry picking what they do and don't uh, value accreditation for and at the end of the day all of them say that accreditation is not 100 percent necessary except for this one group and they're probably wrong if these other two profound ways and implement ways in which that's not necessary therefore you could probably discard it if you do use it, you can cherry pick it, but you can cherry pick it in a way that benefits everyone. Right? So that's kind of what we're doing at this point is saying accreditation needs to be for certain things and not for other things. But I'm like, okay, some of the things you're applying it to, it doesn't really fit in that category. So maybe we should redefine that. Maybe we should adjust that, especially as time goes on. That's what I'm talking about. Making a mandate out of something that's supposed to be a suggestion. Right? The U.S. presidency is an, uh, is an experiment. Like, it's supposed to be an experiment. I'm not going conspiracy right now. I'm, like, literally just talking facts. It's supposed to be an experiment. They say, hey, let's just do this and then see if it works out. And if it doesn't, we'll just dismantle it, make an oligarchy or some random shit. Who knows, right? Triumvirate or something. And we just never dismantle it. Now people feel like American only, America can only ever have a democracy and a presidency. Regardless of what people will tolerate, legally speaking, there is leeway for us to change the government structure entirely. So people keep complaining about the government, this, that, and the third. I'm like, okay, so do something about it. Change it. We as a people, if we like collect all of our common interests and then we say this is a platform we can agree on, and we pump that, then that's going to happen because everybody's behind it. a la every social justice platform you can think of right now. That's the power of community. It shouldn't be either you have this card or you don't. Now we can listen to you about law or we can't, or about education and restructure and reform and or we can't. The truth comes from wherever the truth comes from. The truth is the truth at the end of the day, though. You know? So. Exactly. It was an hour and a half. It was a half hour of me just like getting stuff together, but it was like an hour and a half. I got a lot of it recorded. Right. I'm playing with my phone. Well, there's a person on my phone. I'm playing with a person on my phone. All right. What's up? You said temperament and response. So, like, changing types. So, we tapped on that with the quads. You don't change types. That doesn't happen. 
even Mary put it in her notes, like for a time period, she thought that was the case. Um, and she redacted that in later writings. She said, no, that's not the case. You're just receding into your shadow, your superego, your subconscious, depending on what your situation is. You're supposed to work on your subconscious for your communal benefit and your shadow for partner benefit. And to negative effect, your subconscious comes out when your partner has vexed you, but they're still in your good graces, technically. Um, or to a negative extent, your community has vexed you, but you can't avoid it or remove yourself from it. Then your shadow comes out. Right. Your super ego pops up whenever you're angry, blah, blah, blah. It's not that you're actually changing types is that you're retreating into different parts of your mind. That's it. So an an ENTP in a working environment acts like an ISFJ, like a mama bear in a club, like with their friends or whatever, like um, like a like a doting ENFJ, almost like like very similar. Um, it, likewise, the ENTP in a system of stagnance, where they're not allowed to explore, where they are forced to think about values and morals and such, and you're like, oh, well, as you, you have to think about what the good thing is. No, like they are stifled by having to keep that in mind in the forefront. These are situations where they will slip into their INTJ and then stay there for as long as they're stuck in that situation. If they feel like they can't do anything in their own way or they don't have any wiggle room to do what they need to do to be comfortable or pursue their own interests, then they will stay in their INTJ. And that's how you get this ENTP asshole who looks like they hate everything and blah, blah, blah. Like all the worst things about an INTJ you can hear, that's all that pops up. Right. So then it makes it harder to type certain people. And you're like, well, you were like that last year. And now you're like this. And that means you changed. No, they were at this place in life. And now they're in this place in life. And now they're healthy or they're unhealthy or whatever. That's it. That and the dynamic in which you see them. It's a spectrum. You move up and down the spectrum. That's what they say. I'm healthy, unhealthy, your whole life. Depending on how, you know. Like on a, on a rudimentary basis, basis, you could be like, look, I saw that person yesterday and they had a smile on their face and they were laughing. I see them today and they're sad and shit. They must have changed their whole fucking personality. That's a different person. That doesn't make any sense. It's just how they feel. Like their emotions. They feel different, different days. Hmm. That means you change types. Like, that's, that's another thing. Hmm. But they said, I took the test today. I got different results. Well, you might have just been in a different mood today. Like, Your opinion could have changed. All the things they ask you in these tests yeah. are subjective. And then depending on how you think right. about the thing they're asking you, your answer could be any one of those answers. Any one of them. Exactly. It just depends on, like, the like, angle in which you're thinking. Like, I'll I tell you, like, I, I told you, I do, I've done a lot of dating, all right? Mm-hmm. I actually bring up my original thing just as a fun topic, and I can experiment to see what would happen. Mm-hmm. And I tell them to take the test, but I tell them like I will tell them how to take the test, and they'll actually get it right. They'll, they'll actually get their type from it if you take it. If I tell them don't answer the questions like how you feel today, I mean generally think about how you generally think. Right. Sometimes that helps. It doesn't always work, but they get it closer to what their type is usually. If you tell them that. Like as a concept. Right. Mm. But then it's important that you don't lean too much on the test, too. Like, yeah, for people in general. Like, I, always tell them that. I always make sure I tell them, like, it's, it's only going to help you a little bit. It's not really going to, you know, tell you what it actually is, you mm-hmm. know. And then from there, I'll be like, okay, if you looked at this or you looked at that, you know. Yeah. It's not like, yeah. Anything else? That's the way I learned about that. <laughs> like, yeah, those are my those are my my main questions. You know, pretty much touched on it. Mm. Awesome, outstanding. Yeah, a lot of information. Yeah, I'll, I'll touch on them in other videos and like put detail in there and some images so people can see what I have on my imaginary whiteboard, which most any users have an imaginary whiteboard. So like INFPs have their stare. Um, where they look like they're deers in headlights, but they're actually processing stuff. And then INTJs have their distance. And I think they say they have a a stare as well. Maybe that's an IN thing. I don't recognize INTPs to do that. I come across them often enough, but... 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's just a thing that some any users do. Um, but that whiteboard is going to be visible to people outside of my head when I start doing these videos. So that's kind of part of it is to help make that connection and then um, figure out where the commonalities lie. That part is probably closer to any truth that anyone's looking for. And you can do that in different aspects of life, different aspects of community, to different echelons of interpersonal relationships, right? The, the whole collective consciousness, if you want to say it, all the way down to an individual and the individual's different parts. Um, and then through that, hopefully we'll be able to like figure out what's solid, what's adjustable, what's been verified, cross-examined, et cetera, et cetera, and then work with that and then discard the fluff. And the fluff is, is what people seem to hold on to as if it's as intrinsic as the actual truths that are included in a different bunch of like elements in life. Um, and if you can discard that fluff and just focus on, on what's valid and what's connecting, what's common, then you'll find like these are all just different shades of the same one thing. And that one thing is what we should be working with. And it's malleable. I promise you it's malleable. Because if it wasn't something you could mold, then we wouldn't have so many different interpretations of it. Right? Either it's supposed to be changed throughout time in accordance with time's updates, or it's supposed to be so general that we can apply it as is throughout the rest of time. You can say that about most religious texts. You can say that about most um, legal doctrines, etc. I think there is something to that accord that has to do with the unity of like everything and everyone. Conceptually, abstract, ephemeral, ethereal, physical, metaphysical, you name it. I think there is something there um, besides just existing. So, I don't know. Hopefully... We can uh, get closer to that by communicating like our understandings of certain things, our perspectives of certain things. That's why I don't turn things down in the comments like that, at least typically, unless you're just there for negativity. And even if you are, I'm going to entertain you for a while just to see if something real pops up of that or if I can learn something else from that. You can learn a lot from people besides what you're actually asking them. So, I don't know. Ooh, a burp, a little piggy. So that's the intent. Hmm. That was good. Awesome, outstanding. So you got everything you need, at least for now? We can do another one later or whatever. Yeah, that works. That's uh, good. Yeah, I got, they recorded most of it, so it didn't miss a little part, but it wasn't really important, so. Okay, so I'm gonna start this recording. You didn't have like a an outro or anything, right? No. Okay.